two, one. Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, as well as the internet and VCTV. I want to welcome Emily Kornheiser to the show, as well as John Walters from Vermont Digger, and I am your host, Olga Peters. John, it is so good to see you after <laughs> weeks and weeks of not seeing you. Or seeing anybody. <laughs> Well, there's that. <laughs> Except on little tiny, you know, boxes on your on your computer monitor. Yeah, I'm starting to call this time instead of COVID-19, like the age, the resurgence of the Brady Bunch, because I feel like we're all just in little boxes. Okay. Too bad yeah. we couldn't sing. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it's Emily, best. That Emily, the next time, you, next time you have a committee hearing, you should like, you know, get everybody to sing the Brady Bunch at the beginning. I, <laughs> um, yes, we did try to vote simultaneously yesterday. And um, if that was any indication, I think singing is not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the legislature, for those who don't know John Walters, he writes for Seven Days, which is uh, headquartered I in Montpelier. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I make that mistake sometimes too. I used to write for seven days and I write for VT Digger now. VT Digger now. Yeah. Thank you for catching me on that. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, which, and, and he has been one of the state house reporters uh, for, for the Digger. And I'm curious for both Emily and John, you know, this time of year, if we did not have COVID-19, the legislature would be dealing with some of the end of the session, big budgets, We'd be talking about how many more weeks are left in the session. Will they finish before April? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, that whole kind of tradition has been blown out of the water. So for both you, John, and you, Emily, what's happening as far as the legislature is concerned right now? What, where are you at in adapting to all, all this COVID? <laughs> Well, uh, in terms of reporting, we are just trying to keep track of everything uh, online. You know, we are all in our homes. Uh, we are all, you know, signing into, um, you know, various committee hearings and, uh, and, you know, when the House is in session digitally, as they did for the first time on Thursday. Um, you know, we are watching from our, our uh, workspaces in home. Uh, in terms of like the, the situation for the legislature, uh, Emily may have more insight than I do, but it's completely up in the air right now because uh, under normal circumstances, you have to finish the budget and all that stuff by the end of June in order you know, to meet the constitutional requirements and you finish all the other legislation sometime hopefully in April or early May, and then you're done for the year. And this is a campaign season. So then everybody's attention turns to the election campaign, and particularly for candidates who have primaries. The primary is in August. So you have a fairly quick campaign season until the, the primary. Uh, and now I, I think leadership is talking about, you know, finishing up the COVID related bills and doing a sort of a, a patch and fill budget for the first three months of the new fiscal year and then coming back in the summer, maybe in August, to finish off, to try to do a budget for the rest of the year, because right now we have no idea what state finances are gonna look like. And uh, from my perch as the political columnist, that really throws a wrench into the works because the primary is in August. If the legislature's in session in August, that'll create some very interesting uh, conflicts for a lot of people who are not only office holders, but candidates. Um, mm -hmm. Primary among them would be Senate President Pro Tem Tim Ash, mm -hmm. who is running for Lieutenant Governor, and Lieutenant Governor Z David Zuckerman, who is running for governor. Uh, they're going to be on the job when normally they would be campaigning. So that's just the political angle of this, which I know nobody is thinking about right now. Oh, but, I don't think uh, anyone's thinking no. about it. <laughs> just, just in terms of the the lawmaking aspect of it, it's it's really it's really up in the air right now. Well, and 
uh, I want to just highlight what you said about the overlap between the primary and if the legislature in session, it's kind of a bigger deal because there's an unspoken rule in the state house that you're yeah. not supposed to even think about campaigning or talk about campaigning or announce your campaigning before the end of the session. Um, yeah. Not everyone follows that, but that is kind of the unspoken rule. So yeah, it's, it's another rip in tradition, I guess. <laughs> and to, and add I guess another, no. to add another piece to that, because we will very likely, and the Secretary of State is sort of very close to saying more publicly, has been saying it casually, if the primary is going to be 100%, you know, um, mail-in ballots, that every house will be mailed a ballot, and you can go to the, your polling place if you want for some reason, or if you need to for some reason, but it'll be mail-in ballots, that voting starts in June. Right. That's 45 days before the primary. And so if people normally, I mean, and that's always true, but that's just for people who get it together to request a ballot that far in advance. If they're all being delivered to people's houses that early, then people are likely voting that early. And that's a completely different campaign season, even if we were recessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I have been talking with House candidates. I, I I'm going to be writing a column next week about um, particularly first time House candidates. You know, Emily has kind of an advantage because she's an incumbent and people are aware of her and she's got the name recognition of, of incumbency and uh, hopefully a track record that people will like. Um, but if you're running for legislature for the first time and you can't go door to door mm -hmm. and you can't hold forums um, and you know, it's, it's really tough for those people. Um, and it's, again, for those, for office holders who are being challenged in primaries, they're going to have to choose between campaigning and actually serving. Um, you know, if the legislature takes a break between whenever they finish the, the three month budget and come back for the 2021 budget, um, they're probably still going to be plenty of meetings. And as Emily can tell you, uh, tons and tons of constituent calls. So, you know, the office holders are going to be really busy. Mm -hmm. So the timeline that we're talking about, and so crossover was, crossover um, normally happens the week after town meeting week, which mm -hmm. was in March. Um, I've really like, like super lost track of everything, <laughs> right? I actually was looking at my calendar the other day to be like, how many weeks have I been doing this inside my house? Um, so, Crossover was in March. Um, we actually came home and recessed on Friday the 13th, which is, um, I remembered that the other day and I was like, oh good, I can actually keep that in my head. And so that was supposed to be crossover. Crossover was suspended um, because we spent a week focused in the building on COVID related bills. But then when we came back home to work remotely, the House, the Senate really moved much, the House moved more quickly with our initial COVID legislation, but then the Senate actually remarkably transitioned to their electronic lives much more quickly um, because they're a much smaller body and they can be more flexible. And so the House has been operating in a fairly slower capacity than normal lately. And so we spent more than a month without doing any votes on the House floor. And we did that for the first time yesterday. And the committees have also been moving a lot more slowly, partly because of limited IT capacity. We don't wanna to have too many committees going simultaneously because our IT staff can't handle it. And we need a lot of IT support. Um, Cause many legislators, a lot of this is really brand new to them. Um, operating their iPad is really brand new to them, which is a little, it's one of um, the sort of themes I'd like to come back to about professional development for legislators um, <laughs> operating in an office environment, but that's another, that's a conversation for another day. Um, I've written it so, down though. Okay. Um, and so we've had this whole month where we've been working, but working um, much slower without voting and with very limited information. So we're talking about spending this month passing COVID related and COVID response legislation. And then hypothetically having another month or so where bills that had met um, the suspended crossover timeline could move through. Um, and so not everything that we spent the last year and a half working on will just fall through the cracks into dust. 
But because of the new rules for how we vote in the House, um, controversial bills will likely not surface because we need more agreement in order to pass, in order to bring something to the floor. Um, what are some of the controversial bills? I have completely forgotten all about um, controversial bills. You know, bills. <laughs> like there's some domestic violence legislation oh, yes. that involves some firearms. That's mm -hmm. one um, that was voted out of committee right before this all happened. Um, that's just one example. There's other stuff. There was a really, there's a bill that passed out of um, House Human Services unanimously um, that was about buprenorphine, yeah. which is still quite controversial, even it, though it voted, it was voted out unanimously. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that, that will just involve a lot of um, Brattleboro's own charter change um, around the youth vote, which I mm -hmm. really hustled very hard to get out of committee in time. And I am very sad if not going to probably ever make it to the floor. Um, so things like that. And so we're going to spend a month like that. And then we do have the money bills to pass, but we have so little information about how much money we have and how mm -hmm. much money we will have, partly because we don't understand all of the complexities of the CARES Act because no one does. They're just, they, you know, a law was passed and a lot of the guidance around it has not been figured out yet. Um, so don't want to spend money and then wind up owing it back to the federal government. Um, and so trying to figure out some of the rules there. So don't know how we can spend that money. Also, we're not clear because tax dates were pushed out. We're not clear how much of that money will actually come in and how much of it is lost forever. So we could call it deferred revenue because that's mm -hmm. technically what it is. But estimating what that deferred revenue is, is fairly difficult because it's possible that some people, even though they're holding on, technically they should be holding that money because it is, um, a lot of it's taken sort of as a trustee of the state. So sales tax is received, um, the person's a trustee of the state. It's not the, it's not the property of the person who's collected it. Um, some of that might not come to the state. And then there's also just all of the lost revenue. Um, you know, we're not spending as, at least I'm not spending anywhere near as much money as I usually do. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, and then lost income tax, of course, but that's further out. So mm -hmm. we have no idea how much money we have or how much money will, we will have. And so we might pass a limited budget bill and then come back again and pass sort of a new longer one. So pass just a quarter, um, three months worth of budget and then come back in August. It's also not clear, um, and I know it's not very popular or political to talk about this, it's not clear how we're gonna get paid for that time. Right. Which is another one of the nuances of the citizen legislature. So I have a job. Um, and my job is brilliant and flexible and wonderful in that it allows me to switch between part-time and fuller time. Um, and that even allows me to come back for town meeting break and work full-time that week. But we're trying to do our budget at work for the next fiscal year, also in a limited financial environment, financial information environment. And I have no idea when I'll be able to come back to work full-time. There's rumors um, from the Senate pro tem that I think we're in a digger article about how we likely won't get paid for the work we do in August. And I don't understand how I will have time to do that work if I'm not getting paid, because if I'm not getting paid for my legislative work, I need to be working in my other job so that I can pay my bills. Um, and just like a total lack of information or transparency around all of that nuance is very difficult to plan for and is much easier for folks um, who don't need another job to plan for because they can stay open and flexible. Some of them have had to cancel their vacations, um, but they probably would have had to cancel their vacations anyway because if you know airlines are funny right now. And so that's a really interesting piece about all of this uncertainty is that uncertainty about how we're even going to be doing our jobs in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, that is such a theme. I was talking to someone this week about unemployment insurance, mm. because that's just an article I'm working on right now. And that was one of the, the key things for her is just the uncertainty and the lack of information. She, she's like, I know the Department of Labor is trying, but I, I, I filed, I, but I don't know if I'm in the right category. I don't know if my file went through. I don't know when my money's coming, if I qualified. And she says, and it's that uncertainty that that is the hardest um, 
to deal with. And so it, it feels like that's kind of the ripple theme for all of us in for everyone. Time. Yeah. And on the Department of Labor and the uncertainty three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I asked the speaker to ask the commissioner, do you think perhaps you could develop a flowchart? about all the things that could happen and or go wrong as someone navigates the Department of Labor system and what to do and how to know where you are in all of those situations. And um, she suggested to the commissioner, I have not seen said flowchart yet, um, but another house member and I um, are gonna meet, is today Friday? We're gonna meet mm -hmm. tomorrow, Saturday, um, okay. to try to start developing that flowchart because it's really that, that unknown is one of the hardest parts about this. It's the hardest part about navigating state systems under the best of circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. We never know what the future holds, but as humans, we like to forget that because how else do we <laughs> operate, right? And it's, we're all so aware of it right now and it makes everything, yeah, the tension. How, how about for, for you, John? What are you seeing as far as the unknown, the lack of information, where are you seeing that kind of squirrel things up? Either in your own life or in your reporting life? <laughs> well, um, I, I am relatively fortunate in that I, I still have a job and uh, my partner still has a job, so we are doing fine that way and we have a house and all that stuff. But uh, it's just in terms of doing my job, it's harder to sort of get a handle on what's going on because you're not in the building. And a lot of what we do is we hang around in the building. You know, I spend most of my time in the state house cafeteria. You know, uh, people come over and talk to me or I snag people as they're walking by because that's where everybody goes sooner or later. Uh, and it's creepy to hang out outside the bathroom. Um, so it's- um, Lobbyists do that though. <laughs> well, they're a little bit creepier than the reporters, I hope. Uh, anyway, um, that's a big part of what we do. That's like, you know, so what's going on? You know, that's a big question. Uh, I ask people and people ask me too. Um, and that's a big part of sort of the communication that goes on informally. And that isn't happening now. Uh, and, you know, people are available by phone, but uh, that takes a, some conscious effort. Um, which we don't always have time to do. In terms of, of lawmaking, it's, as Emily said, it, it's all just completely up in the air. Emily mentioned some of the bills that, that are almost certain to die, uh, which means they'll have to start all over again in 2021. Um, I, would, I would add to what she talked about, you know, Act 250 reform, which has been a huge workload for House Natural Resources, right. uh, cannabis, uh, the Cannabis Tax and Regulate Bill. Um, there are a bunch of things. I would even point to something that I spent a little bit of time covering, uh, a resolution uh, to formally apologize for eugenic sterilizations, mm -hmm. um, which would be the first time that Vermont has actually taken a stand on that uh, and actually, you know, acknowledge that this was a huge terrible injustice that has that still has reverberations today even though we like to think of it as something that happened long ago um and then there's the whole financial picture we have no idea what it's going to look like um we have no idea what's going to happen you know just uh, the other day the, the the head of the cdc said that we should be planning for a resurgence of COVID 19 this fall when it's mm -hmm. flu season and that that might be even worse. And then, you know, there's a second shock wave in the economy and there's a second way, you know, quarantine, self quarantining effort. And then whatever the legislature does in August might be blown up completely. Uh, and then even if you assume that we get back to some semblance of normal, say next January, um, I think the agenda for the legislature and for the governor is going to be completely different by then, not only Absolutely. because of the immediate repercussions, but also uh, as you know, this has exposed a lot of the fault lines in our society, mm -hmm. in our government, in our, um, you know, economy. And I think that there's going to be a huge need for a different way of looking at things mm -hmm. from, you know, social services to healthcare to, um, you know, uh, efforts to boost the economy might look completely different. Um, and broadband is going to be a much bigger issue whenever we get back to normal. I've been, um, can I ask you about that, John? So, um, yeah. and thank you for highlighting that it's both the heavy lifts and the controversial issues that are sort of 
might fall into the dustbin. Uh, I think that's an important point. I'm really hopeful about um, what might be the future implications of these fault lines that have been revealed, because they're issues that have been important to me for a long time, and they're issues that I want to surface much more in the legislature, and I want broader yeah. understanding of. And yet, I find myself really concerned about how we're going to navigate those really important complex issues that now we have broader understanding of in an environment that I think has, is going to have a deep tendency to be operating from a place of scarcity and fear. Um, yeah. And in the midst of all of that, what you were saying about the cafeteria and the hallways, we're all operating without the cafeteria and the hallways too. Mm -hmm. yep. And so the kind of creative conversations, the kind of cross committee conversations, all of that is gone. Uh, and so how to even begin those processes of like navigating what the future might be and what creative thinking might be is just seems impossible in this environment, though I know we yeah. have to figure it out. Yeah, and, and we are, uh, I mean, we have been living through an age of sort of like belt tightening for a long time, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot worse, um, no matter what happens with COVID-19, even if it just sort of goes away magically, as, mm -hmm. as some in positions of authority have suggested. <laughs> um, you know, this, is just what we have gone through to this point is going to have deep economic reverberations for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about like in Brattleboro, the small business community, the downtown, you know, what if half of the restaurants in Brattleboro don't survive this? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, same thing in my town of Montpelier. Uh, you know, those small businesses that are the heart of our downtowns that make them such great places to go. You know, those people are struggling and there's no way for them to make up for the loss of just being completely shut down for weeks or months. Uh, you know, uh, it's, and then, you know, if property values fall, then the education fund is imperiled. It's just, we, you know, and, and then you're trying to address these big structural issues uh, with even fewer resources and uncertain resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is, uh, this is going to be a huge challenge for folks like Emily mm -hmm. <laughs> to deal with. Yeah, both in both in your legislative job, but also your day job. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So on that note, we need to uh, take a break for some of our underwriters. I hope um, I just want to say this now. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEWLP 107.7 Brattleboro really appreciates its underwriters. We haven't heard promos from them lately because of technical glitches on my side. So we're going to take a break and hopefully there will be underwriters there. If there are not, please know underwriters, we appreciate you. Um, we will be back in a moment. Hello and welcome back to the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW LP 107.7 Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have with me Emily Kornheiser, as well as John Walters. And we just need to remind people because we haven't, Emily, in a long time. Oh, we have not. No, we have not. Because I'm so bad. I always think our writer, our listeners don't need to be reminded. But the views and opinions expressed on this show are ours and ours alone. And do no one not else's. reflect the radio station. Remember that, John. Those are your <laughs> opinions. <laughs> I, I, I am aware of that all the time. So I want to, since we were talking a little bit about budget and, um, you know, the, the feeling of scarcity and, and the uncertainty that we're all feeling right now, I had a recent conversation with Lyle Holiday, this, the outgoing superintendent of the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union, and she was talking about what the school system is going to do about students they haven't heard from at all because teachers have been trying to keep touches with students and families, but there's a handful that they have heard zilch from and they don't know why. I mean, it could be everything from they're staying out of state with family to they're, you know, God forbid they're all sick with COVID-19. Um, or I think this is one of Lyle's concerns too. There's something happening in the home mm -hmm. that 
is not healthy right now. And that's why students are out of touch. And it just, I think it highlights that whole issue right now of what can be happening around, um, out of sight, out of mind, around things like domestic violence, child abuse, and, and what can that mean um, for the folks who are supposed to be uh, supporting folks who need help at this time, in a time when we can't have direct contact. I have yeah. um, an extra gig that I normally, um, you know, on the pile of Vermonter gigs, where I have a private contract to facilitate the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory District's Attendance Council. Um, and that's a monthly meeting where all of the school counselors, um, principals, vice principals, various folks from the whole school district or supervisory union um, come together and talk about how to support kids in getting to school. Um, and the challenges of that and how, you know, family dynamics really, and whatever's going on in people's lives make all the rest of everything else very difficult and various strategies that schools use to engage with families in a way that's supportive rather than alienating, right? Because you want to be part of someone's life rather than an extra bridge to cross. Um, and then parallel to that, ha been having great conversations with Representative Sebelia about, you know, the technology gap. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually some of the, especially the folks that we work with in Bellows Falls at Youth Services are experiencing a lot of technology gaps with accessing school. Um, and so how that's a huge gap between families and the world right now, folks who don't have access to the internet and or computers or technology. Um, and just how all of this is really continuing to widen existing, um, we can call them achievement gaps, opportunity gaps, whatever they are. Some kids are gonna do much better for this time away from school because they're gonna have time now to go much deeper and focus more on things that interest them. And some kids are gonna come out the other side of this with you know, many more challenges in entering the school system around behaviors and learning and habits and whatever else. And, we are not set up to support families or kids in that holistically. We know there's probably a lot of domestic violence happening. Family services um, as a department or an agency in the Agency of Human Services knows that reports are down, knows why reporting is down, has no illusions that there is less challenges with child protection right now, but really has no mechanisms or tools to be doing that sort of preventative work. Um, they really, entirely operate as an enforcement arm um, and have you know schools and doctors and other mandated reporters be sort of the eyes and ears of their system and so i from my perspective this is a real opportunity to pivot how we do our work but that takes again that creative thinking mm -hmm. yeah the the fact that mandated reporters uh are not seeing kids right now uh by and large uh means that there is almost certainly um, a crisis building in child abuse and probably in domestic violence and we have seen indications that the suicide rate is is up uh, you know everything is basically it's like a pot of soup that's boiling with a lid tamped down tightly on it mm. and we don't know what's happening under that lid right now and it's even harder because of all the stresses of COVID. Um, we are probably, whenever things do return to some semblance of normal, we are almost certainly going to see an explosion of need for social services of all kinds and maybe mm -hmm. even medical intervention uh, and the courts. If we have a wave of you know, child abuse and domestic violence that suddenly emerges, uh, that's going to be one of the consequences of, of this uh, pandemic and we have no idea how big or how bad it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how we're going to be really clear right now that that's gonna happen and we're gonna need the resources to tackle that on the other end. Yeah. Because we're seeing a lot of debate in the legislature around educational funding. And mm -hmm. you know, from my perspective, it's essential that schools have even more funding next year to be able to tackle those challenges. The teachers yeah, I spoke to. Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. No. 
um, yeah, I, I mean, schools are responsible for a lot of social services, and that's a lot of it's a lot of delivery of social services and and watchdogging, and that's part of the reason that school budgets are higher than they mm -hmm. used to be twenty or thirty years ago because a lot of that burden has been shifted onto the schools. Um, I also wanted to note that you know there are kids, a lot of kids, for whom the home is not necessarily a safe haven. A lot of humans. Uh, well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, uh, LGBTQ kids mm -hmm. uh, whose parents may not be accepting, and the only support they got was at school from their friends or from you know teachers or whatever, uh, and you know kids with all sorts of other troubles that were getting some sort of management. Autistic kids, you know, kids with any any sort of learning challenge, were getting some measure of support at school, and they're not now. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the gap between the haves and the have-nots that you talked about, Emily, getting worse right now. Absolutely. And again, we're going to see maybe we'll have school in September. Maybe we won't. Mm -hmm. Who knows when they'll be back in, in school again. Um, and, and when they do return, um, it could be really bad for a long time. I, the teachers I, I spoke to made it very clear that one of the things they're planning for when school does return into session is how, you know, these students, we think uh, automatically, gee, they've missed out on some academic time. Uh, but for these teachers, they're like, especially the ones for younger kids, where they have missed out on social time and they have missed out on community. And we're going to have to repair that mm -hmm. and be prepared to to actually support students who socially have, have been hurt by this time. So I wanna I highlight a sort of a public information note before we move on um, around queer kids and opportunities that are available during this time. A lot of the um, queer youth groups that operate at schools, some of them are still operating and available for any kids that wanna sort of enter that virtual space. However, some of them are um, not able to operate because they don't have parents' permission. And so they were mm -hmm. able to sort of make their way into those classrooms and opportunities while they were at school. But um, after school groups are held to sort of much stricter permissions around electronic communication. And so those are limited. There is a really great texting service um, that I saw on out in the opens um, Instagram feed, but I'm sure there's other places to find it. That's about, it's basically someone will send you sign up and someone will send you a daily or more than daily text that affirms your gender identity. For folks who are really like in a space in their home where people are denying their existence every day to have that one lifeline. Mm -hmm. And so that's available um, for people on out in the opens website or any other way to get in touch with out in the open. Thank you, Emily, for bringing that up. It, it is heartening to see how many, um, how many people in all walks of life have really stepped up to try to deal with the challenges that we're facing right now, um, from medical researchers to social service providers to mm -hmm. teachers, um, restaurants that are providing food, um, all sorts of businesses are, and all sorts of individuals in all walks of life are are really doing some incredible things. Um, and, you know, we and a lot of other media outlets are trying to report on stories of people who are doing great things, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's knitting masks or keeping in touch with students or whatever it is. But there's a lot of really great stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can carry all of that great stuff into this new future, um, as well yeah. as sort of the other larger, more formal opportunities that we're going to need to fill. Yeah. Well, and, and because I, I think this is really important to note now, to hold on to these, these moments of this is what wasn't working, this is how people solved it, mm -hmm. because as Emily has said more than once, we're going to need that creative thinking when we go back to quote unquote normal life. Um, and we are kind of hitting that transition. The governor has uh, issued a new executive order about reopening the economy. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have concerns about opening things too quickly only because I don't want us to undo the good work we did at flattening that curve. Mm -hmm. That's a different conversation. Uh, but both Emily and I, John, have found it very fascinating that the real estate market 
is one of the first things to start opening up again. Mm -hmm. And we have talked on this show about, um, we have some communities that are heavily, their real estate market heavily um, relies on the second home market. Yes. Uh, and so Emily and John, I'm wondering, have you been watching this? What are you thinking about uh, real estate property values? And are we going to see a blip in people who are like, I am done with the city. I'm not doing a pandemic in a city again. I am out of here. Um, all those implications. Have you guys been watching that? So there's a few pieces of that for me. One, Vermont has been the apocalypse home for a hundred years. I mean, that's essentially how the bulk of immigration into Vermont has happened. Um, and we can, you know, there are generations of different versions of that. There's generations of sort of utopian seeking and escapism and, um, but that was all essentially, you know, had an edge of apocalypse um, escape to it or apocalypse planning. And so I want to name that this is a historic legacy of Vermont, not just like a new thing because of the pandemic. Yeah. And we've well, branded and we also, ourselves that way. Right. Well, and also, I mean, we've been having a lot of conversations before COVID about Vermont being a place for climate refugees mm -hmm. in the future yep. as well. So yeah, this is, Emily, you're so right about that. And so there's that piece of it that I don't want to let go of um, that, we're, that we're living with. Um, and then there are all of the folks who maybe did not work remotely and now have learned um, that they can work remotely, right? And so that gives even more opportunities for people who might have wanted to move to Vermont and were living somewhere else and felt like they would never be able to find a way financially to um, have a career here that now realize or their employer realized that, you know, distance works. Um, and that ties into the whole, you know, strange Senate fixation on the remote worker and the incentives for the remote worker that we do not need to get into today. <laughs> and so we have those two layers, right? Apocalypse home, remote worker, and then, you know. Well, and I'll add one more layer. We yeah. need more people to come to Vermont. Indeed. We need more jobs and we need better yeah. paying jobs. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And there are, you know, a lot of empty homes in Vermont Partly because, you know, with our, the level of our wages and that incredible age of our real estate, most folks who live in Vermont um, and sort of know the score would never buy a 150 year old farmhouse that needs $200,000 worth of work to be livable, right? Like, we're, we're not gonna, I mean, I might have fallen for that, but like, we're not gonna fall for that, right? <laughs> barn. I'm ridiculous and foolish, but. So there's that piece too, that a lot of the property that's being purchased right now n would not be necessarily purchased by a Vermonter anywhere close to its asking price because of how much inc like profound money needs to be poured into it to make it livable. And so that leaves us open for a flood of humans. And what are the implications of that? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it might be a flood of humans. It might also be a flood of empty houses that are owned as getaways by mm -hmm. people in cities who rarely, if ever, use them. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have a situation where, you know, every house in Brattleboro, the price of every house in Brattleboro could rise. Mm -hmm. Half of them could be empty. Um, you know, people who actually live in Brattleboro would find the properties less affordable and the businesses would not get any advantage because the people who own those houses are not here. Yes. Uh, that's one scenario. That's kind of the, the nightmare scenario, except that it would help the school district with property taxes. Great for uh, our tax base, terrible for our communities. Right. Yes, exactly. And those people, even if they spend, you know, let's say uh, generously, they spend a few weeks every year in, in that house, they're certainly not gonna feel part of the community. Uh, and the community is not going to feel like they're part of, of that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's an interesting twist on this and something that frankly I had not thought of because I live in Montpelier and uh, that sort of effect is, is a lot farther away. I think it's something that's, that's, it's not unique to Southern Vermont, but the effects are going to mostly be held in Southern, felt, felt in Southern Vermont. The other mm -hmm. place that I, um, I've been really surprised as I've gotten to know legislators from the Northeast Kingdom is how huge a force that is there as well. 
Um, and that's been really interesting to me. I think the yeah. difference is that in the kingdom, folks are much more used to not minding their neighbor's business. Uh, and so communities that are very sort of spread out and disconnected with everyone knowing each other still um, can really, that dynamic can sustain through a flood of second homes. Whereas I think in Southern Vermont, we have much more of an expectation of knowing our neighbors and being in relation with our neighbors rather than being in relation with the people you run into at the general store. Um, mm. And so I think that's one of the ways it's different in the kingdom, but still a real challenge around housing prices up there. Yeah, let alone like ski towns, mm. which are already suffering with like, you know, absentee ownership and Airbnb and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and Chris Campany, the executive director of the Wyndham Regional Commission has been sort of keeping an eye as well on some of the transportation changes uh, and the kind of the expansion of rail service. Because he says, you know, there's a very good chance that as far as Southern Vermont's concerned, it could become a bed community, a bedroom community for uh, the more urban areas of Massachusetts mm -hmm. and and what would that mean for our community could be good could be mm, you know who knows but it's it's something that I'm not sure I'm not sure we as a community really think about like we mm -hmm. think about it in very siloed terms like oh it's it's ski area houses or it's second homes or or people who have fled the city but we're not looking kind of holistically as like what would this mean for our region mm -hmm. one thing i've it, always uh, been sorry john go ahead um the the sort of like the extreme scenario of that is vancouver british columbia mm -hmm. um a lot of of chinese uh wealthy people wealthy people from other areas of the world are buying homes in Vancouver in order to have a foothold in Canada in case they need to evacuate for whatever reason, in case they need a place to go. So housing prices are absolutely through the roof. They're astronomic in Vancouver. And a lot of neighborhoods are, are basically empty mm -hmm. uh, because people have bought these homes. It's cheap for somebody who's you know worth millions or billions to buy a house and then never use it. Um, mm. And that's what they're doing. And a lot of these houses are kind of falling apart. Nobody's mowing the lawn, nobody's doing anything. And obviously nobody's involved in the community. Uh, and nobody who actually lives in Vancouver can afford to buy a house. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to happen in, you know, Brattleboro, but uh, some very mild version of that could happen in Brattleboro. You know, it's so interesting, John, when I was living in London in 2008, 2009, they were having similar conversations because something in a lot of neighborhoods, the same thing had happened that folks from overseas had bought these houses. So yeah. they would have a foothold, but then no one's there and they're falling apart. Mm -hmm. And of course, London at the time was having a real crunch on rental markets. They mm -hmm. needed more rental properties. Um, and we already have really that to some degree here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, it hasn't led to gentrification per se, but it mm -hmm. has led to really um, a very divided real estate market where sort of the middle doesn't exist and is not available to families who want to purchase homes and then free up um, other homes for rentals. And so as that goes further, if that goes further, we're going to have to be really careful about, you know, not further growing. You know, so simultaneous to that, we have this increased awareness of the fact that like, you know, people need housing to be safe, right? Um, mm -hmm probably should have understood that before, but it seems like we're like really clear on that now. Um, and so <laughs> want to make sure that we're not losing that thread and not keeping that thread separate from the real estate speculation thread because they are so, you know, it is all one system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, you know, the Bellows Falls Police Department, this is sort of a funny little tweak fact, but the Bellows Falls Police Department, to work there, you're required to live within Rockingham. And oh, interesting. There, it's mostly around on call and making sure that folks who are on call can get to a site in time. It's not about um, community policing and the original development of the policy. But I think there are really interesting implications for it when we think about service provision and community engagement in Brattleboro or in Wyndham County um, and living in sort of this tri-state area. 
and if folks can't afford to live in the community that they're working in, what that means for how services are provided and how people understand the communities that they're serving. If folks can't, um, if folks are sort of seeking Brattleboro area jobs and living elsewhere, what that does. And we already see that a lot, that a lot of the folks who work in service provision in Brattleboro might live over the border in New Hampshire or in Massachusetts and be commuting. And it just creates, a, it's a very different identity um, and a very different sort of set of hustle that people go through. Mm -hmm. And a very different volunteer base. Yes. Yes. Well, and it's a good thing to note too, just on the, the ripple effect, if we want a community where people, and I know we talk about this in Brattleboro a lot, where people are biking to work, walking to work, whatever, if people can't actually afford to live in their, their community where they work, then guess what? They're probably not going to be biking or walking. They're probably going to be driving. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, we had a meeting of the Climate Caucus yesterday and we were talking about sort of what, you know, globally, I think we're spending a lot of time talking about what we've learned about climate change and our potential for climate change action based on this new time in our lives. Um, and sort of, you know, we've seen the canal. I don't know if everyone has seen the videos of the canals in Venice and how they're healthy again. Um, it's inspiring, right? It's inspiring, it's sad and inspiring, and that we have less cars on the roads because people aren't going anywhere, um, which I actually haven't noticed a big reduction in cars on the road in Brattleboro. But how we can sort of sustain the good parts of that, right, um, while still making sure people are, you know, getting their basic needs met, which I don't think is necessarily true right now while the cars are slowed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. We are coming close to the end of time. <laughs> but I know it was like boom. There was a way you said that that it sounded like we were like at end times, not the end of our time. <laughs> it sometimes so feels we that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I but I want to come back to a conversation that we were having before we started the recording going, because I think in this um, cycle of COVID we're all going through these collective emotions. I think there was fear and grief at the beginning. And now I don't know about you folks, but I am going through this general sense of just overwhelm, especially with details. Like I just can't make another decision. Um, and I'm wondering if you are feeling this. I think, I think everybody is under unusual and sometimes subtle pressures. You know, just because, you know, a lot of people are, you know, have job insecurity or they've lost their jobs or they don't have a safe place to live. Uh, and for them, the stresses are obvious and overwhelming. But every little thing we do every day is more stressful and just different than it used to be. You know, I, I actually kind of like, I think about making sure we have enough eggs in the house in a way that I never did before. Uh, you know, you go to a store and, <laughs> and you see like some of the shelves are almost empty and you're really tempted to grab whatever it is that's, that's, there's like three boxes left of, even if you don't usually use it. And, you know, and being on Zoom calls and, you know, Facebook chats all the time, uh, every little thing we do is different and more stressful. And we are all out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes its toll over time. Uh, that's why we see, you know, some people saying, open things up, let us out of our houses, I need a haircut, you know, all that stuff, which sounds stupid, but, but really it's, it's reflecting a basic human need for, you know, the regularity of daily life, and we don't have that now. Mm -hmm. I find that the places, all of those things, all of the stresses being more heightened, being aware that um, I also have sort of a narrative that I don't deserve to acknowledge my stress because I have a salary job and um, I'm really busy. And then there's sort of like the third level, which is, oh, it feels like a very like female middle-class Southern Vermont lady thing of like, everyone else is baking sourdough bread and I don't have time to, <laughs> um, which is like such an absurd thing for me to be wasting any emotional energy on. And then um, I find that the places that I usually refill my well 
are not available to me right now and I need to find new yeah. places for them. And so some of the sociality, but more of that for me is um, creative intellectual spaces mm. and doing that with other people. And those kinds of conversations feel very, that creative space feels very unavailable to me right now. And that's where I fill my well from all of the other sort of um, tedium of, policy. It's the creative piece of policy that's so fulfilling to me and that's not available. And so all the other things have trouble balancing out. While I, I love eating lunch at home so much, it's the best. Um, but I also have, you know, the time I'm spending with family is time that during the normal legislative session, I spend working 12, 14, 18 hour days up in Montpelier. And I can't work an 18 hour day in my house in Brattleboro because my family will riot. Um, and so that's also a really sort of interesting piece to all of this is that one of those shifts and what family time looks like mm -hmm. that I find both stressful and beautiful. Mm -hmm. I hope we're all finding ways to document this time and, and all its nuances um, so that it is in the long term, it will be something more than just the time we, we all didn't get to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you say that, I think, oh no, that's another pressure on myself that I'm not fulfilling right now. <laughs> so I, one, I, want to that, like, I really think that that's both of your job and not my job. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And two, um, I was Vermont, actually thinking of journaling. I wasn't thinking right, of something whatever. formal. <laughs> um, the Vermont Histo Historical Society is doing a really cool story core kind of project related to that that I think people should know about um, that you can find on their website or various ways that they're communicating. So that's another sort of more personal piece of that. Rumble Strip, which is one of my favorite podcasts, is also doing some really cool pieces on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anything you wanted to add or wish I had asked before we sign off? The whole thing is so overwhelming. You know, when you sit down and think about all the challenges that we face, um, it is really stunning. And, and we have no idea what the universe is gonna look like in two months, let alone six months or a year or five years. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I, when I talk to people, they talk about the challenges and they also talk about how Vermonters are responding. And I know I talked about this earlier, but it's worth repeating that we are discovering, you know, areas of strength in ourselves that we didn't need to tap before and now we need it. And we are finding that like, especially in a lot of our smaller communities, that there is this strength of community that doesn't exist in big cities. Uh, that is a tremendous asset. Uh, there are great things about Vermont and there are great things that Vermonters in all areas of life are doing right now. Uh, and that's an important thing to realize even as we are facing all the stresses and the difficulties and the social, you know, you know uh, earth shaking issues um, is that we are all finding ways to respond and deal with and help other people um, and, and that's important to remember as well. Absolutely. We are so resilient and creative and generous. And I am very hopeful that we can build policies and governance from that place of resilience and creativity and generosity. Um, and that we find space for that in the months ahead. Well, thank you to both of you. I have to say, I am so grateful for this podcast and for all the people who have participated in it because um, this space for conversation, I think that's one of the blessings of COVID is some of us are experiencing challenges perhaps we never had before. And yet they're challenges that many people have in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I think it will change conversations going forward. So Representative Emily Kornheiser, thank you for joining us. John Walters of Vermont Digger, thank you for joining us. John, if people want to read your articles, where can they find them? 
Well, the site is vtdigger.org. Um, I will also mention a, and a daily email service that we do. Uh, it's called Final Reading, and you can sign up for it on our website, vtdigger.org. It's sort of a roundup of everything that's happened legislatively uh, on legislative work days. Uh, it's free. You just have to, you know, provide an email address for us to send it to you. Uh, so uh, that's where you can find me. Thank you. Emily? Uh, emilykornheiser.org, ekornheiser at gmail, ekornheiser at ledge.state.vt.us. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, or not really Twitter, though I try. And um, every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the foreseeable future, all of the Brattleboro State representatives, myself, Tristan Tolino, and Molly Burke, are holding a virtual coffee hour. And so folks can find um, access to that virtual meeting room via Front Porch Forum, or um, there's a Facebook event on my legislative Facebook page, or just get in touch and I'll send you a link. Thank you. Can I, can I leave you with the funniest thing I saw on Zoom this week? Oh, please do. Please. Uh, it was a, a Senate committee hearing, uh, and uh, your colleague Jeanette White was one of the members of the committee. So there she is on Zoom. And she didn't realize it, but she had her notepad right in front of her camera, her camera, her phone, and she started taking notes. And suddenly, there was this pen <laughs> going across the screen. <laughs> Just and a at first, I didn't pen. know what it. At first, I didn't know what it was. It was like this this giant object that suddenly like <laughs> dancing across the screen. And then I realized she's taking notes. So, be be aware of what you're doing when you're on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that, that is such good, good advice. Thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour. I'm your host, Olga Peters. You can find us on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, at 2 on Friday afternoons or as well at the Vermontitude SoundCloud page and the Vermontitude Facebook page. Have a great weekend, everyone.